This conference well will now be recorded. And thank you, Aaron. Uh, and STS 87. And amongst those three spacewalks, um, brought in a, a Japanese satellite that was, uh, things went wrong and it was quite a mission. And he can tell you a little bit about that in the con context, that evaluated suits through the nighttime, all sorts of different opportunities. You know, we talk about roles of, 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 of the astronaut and the ability to inspire people, the ability to get people interested in STEM, to serve kind of a greater good, to be, um, you know, to live a life of, of merit and of global global perspective. And, and I think that's, you know, Winston throughout his career has embodied all of that and recognizes the bridges that uh, that that space builds between all of us, you know, looking at the names here coming from so many different countries, yet there's so much that brings us all together uh, through space. And about barriers, too, is a, is a common topic, you know, indeed, tearing down barriers wherever they may exist, is certainly the impetus for our outreach programs, all we do to make space uh, accessible for all, you know, if there's um, you know, financial barriers, we work to make our programs accessible. If there are cultural barriers, we try to take these things down. And, and Winston has been a part of this from the start and, and you know, fusing in his experience and his vision uh, with us as well. So it's always very, uh, very grateful to have uh, him a part and committed to this community. And uh, today is going to be a little diff uh, different than uh, some of you had, had met uh, before uh, coming into our program, this is going to be a little more of a technical discussion because it's an overlap of two of our existing courses, uh, FTE 101, Introduction to Flight Test Engineering, and uh, EVA 105, which is the Underwater Spacesuit Evaluation uh, course. Both of these courses are brand new, and they happen to overlap uh, with a lot of Winston's direct hands-on experience. So um, thank you whoever set the record <laughs> button here, and uh, without further ado, I'd want to hand this over. Uh, Winston, the, the classes are yours. All right, well, good. Thank you so much, Jason, for that introduction. And uh, good evening, at least this evening uh, here on the East Coast to you all. Uh, what I'm going to do is, is talk very, very, very briefly about some of my experiences. But I think the most valuable part of this session, the most fun part will be when we get to talk back and forth to each other. So I want to have plenty of time available for some really good old two-way communications. So again, thanks for allowing me to be here with you. Hope you guys are all doing well. Weird times going on with all the pandemic and all of that, uh, which forces us to, to communicate via the internet rather than in person, but we're, we're gonna have some fun with this. Uh, so two classes, flight test engineering and also EVA or underwater EVA, EVA evaluations. Let me tell you just a little bit uh, about some of my experiences. As Jason said, I'm a naval aviator, at least retired naval aviator, 27 years on active duty with the Navy. The last seven were with NASA as an astronaut. So I'm gonna back up just a little bit. The first 12 years of my time in the Navy was as an operational pilot. That means I'm ready to be assigned to combat. Had the country gone to war, and then I probably would have gone into the combat zone. So I was training and operating and deploying and, uh, and uh, acting as a combat uh, pilot. Now, after 12 years, I became what the Navy called an aerospace engineering duty officer. That means I shifted my focus over into the research development testing evaluation area. I got into the systems command as opposed to the operational command. My first assignment was what was as what was called a uh, production test pilot. And I was up at a place called the Naval uh, Aviation Depot at Jacksonville, Florida. The depot performs what we call depot level maintenance on, uh, on aircraft. That means they, they take airplanes in and they tear them completely apart. Everything comes down to the last screw and nut, the engines come apart. Then they put all that back together. They run the engines in the test cell, they test the airplanes on the ground and so on. And yours truly gets to go out and fly the reassembled airplane on production test flights. Now, one of the things that, one interesting phenomenon I had, I, it kind of combined flying and uh, data taking and evaluation. I had flown a test flight on an A7. A7 is, was the Navy's single engine, single seat light attack airplane. It's a carrier based light attack jet. And during the course of, of a test flight, 
I would have to check the manual fuel control. Okay, I take the airplane up to 40,000 feet and I'd hit a certain Mach number and I'd switch off the automatic fuel control and switch to manual fuel control. In manual fuel control, the pilot has to operate the engine in such a manner that it remains within its parameters. You don't have any automatic limitations or, 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 or uh, any automatic features for you. So I switched, I took this airplane up, I'm at Mach 0.87 or whatever it was, I don't remember that. And I pulled the throttle back, switched to manual fuel, manual fuel control. And as I began to bring the throttle back up, the engine would not accelerate as it should have. So I began losing altitude. I'm still trying to bring the engine up. It's not operating properly and so on. So finally I get the throttle all the way full forward, what we call military power, and the engine was not operating as it should have operated. Okay, no big deal. Pull the throttle back, switch back to automatic fuel control, come back home and land. Well, when I uh, wrote up the discrepancy, the maintenance people did not want to adjust or change the fuel control. They pointed out that the fuel control was operating within the book parameters. We got the engineers involved. The engineer said, well, the end of fuel control is operating within uh, the, the book parameters. But I was convinced that the fuel control needed to be changed. So what I did is I asked the data services to pull out data from the previous 10 A7 test flights that I had flown. So they pulled out the two, the 10, data cards from 10 different A7s that I had flown, I plotted the performance of the fuel control from each of those 10 flights, and then I, I plotted the upper control limit and the lower control limit. And if, anybody, if any of you have ever studied statistical process control, that's what I did. You use what's called a root mean square equation. When you solve it, as, as you know, you get a, a positive value and a negative value those become my upper and lower control limits. And uh, anything within that boundary is said to be in control. A point that falls outside of that boundary is out of family or out of control. Lo and behold, that particular flight where the fuel control didn't operate properly, its data point fell out of family. So when I showed that information to the technicians and to the engineers, guess what, immediately, they were willing to change the fuel control and put a new one on and get that airplane operating properly. So here's an example as to where I flew a bunch of test flights. One was out of family, but I couldn't convince anybody of it until I ran the equations and showed them mathematically that it was out of family. So an experience of a combination of flying, taking data, reducing the data, and then, and then using statistical process control to get a point across. Uh, fast forward, I left uh, Jacksonville, the place where I, this A7 event occurred, and I went to a place called Warminster, Pennsylvania. It was one of the Navy's labs. Navy has a, has a lot of laboratories around, and the, the laboratory at Warminster was the Navy's lead lab for research, development, testing, evaluation of aircraft systems. Okay, so we had all kinds of airplanes uh, on the field. We had helicopters, we had patrol planes, we had... Uh, propeller-driven planes, we had fighters, tactical jets. I was the deputy director of the tactical aircraft systems department, which means that we handle fighters and attack aircraft and so on. I got to test a lot of different systems uh, during that tour of duty. And uh, one of the more interesting systems that I got to test was one called non-cooperative target recognition system. And I can't talk too much about it because that system is actually used on today's fighters. Well, we developed it there at Warminster. I was the first pilot to fly it. But I will tell you this, I had to go out and first take data. And I took data by flying against some of our other airplanes as targets. And the system would read certain parameters from those airplanes, store them up, and those parameters were used to uh, allow us to develop an algorithm that would say, if an aircraft did not exhibit those familiar parameters, it must be an enemy airplane. This was, this was early on, and that's kind of a simplification. So we flew those test flights and gathered the data, and then flew the early flights on what's called the non-cooperative target recognition system, which is used today on uh, US Navy fighters. What was really interesting, though, I'm going to change courses here, is a different research development project in which I got involved. 
This one needed my pilot skills, but it was not actually in the airplane. Warmints, that this lab I'm telling you about, at one point housed the world's most capable centrifuge. It was, that's right, the most capable centrifuge in the world. Early astronauts trained on that centrifuge. Well, I'm at this facility, I'm a tactical aircraft test pilot at this facility, but the folks over in physiology were developing what they called a G-tolerance improvement program. Some of you may or may not be familiar, but several years ago, we were losing airplanes, high, high G airplanes, particularly F-16s, and we didn't really know why. It turned out that pilots would sometimes black themselves out. The plane crashes and the investigation uh, ensues and say, well, there's nothing wrong with the airplane. We don't know what happened. It finally came to light that pilots were blacking themselves out. So the Navy set out conducting research and developing what's, what's called a G-tolerance improvement program. And uh, I was uh, on the pilot side working with the aviation physiologist to develop this program. So long story short is that the ultimate test, the final test was in the centrifuge that I flew. And it was a, a graduated G profile. We would start with the centrifuge at rest and then, then turn it on and G would gradually build up. As the G forces build up on me, I'm totally relaxed on this first run the blood began to pool away from my head into my lower extremities, and I, I would begin to gray out. Now, the way I would measure my gray out is by a string of lights on the panel in front of me. As I began to gray out, my, my vision began to tunnel. And when I got to the point where I was at 30% light loss, that was called grayed out. Now, I'm perfectly conscious, but my vision has tunneled. It turned out that the average person resting, that is not straining at all, will great, begin to grab about three and a half Gs or four Gs or thereabout. So on the subsequent run, I was, I was to strain. And as I strain, my vision would gray out, but I could actually keep it at 30% or less up to eight Gs. Eight Gs is a lot, especially for an individual strain with no GC. Okay, another data point. The final data point is I would add a G suit, and I think you all know what a G suit, an anti G suit that pilots wear around their waist and legs that inflates with high G. It inflates and puts pressure on your lower extremities to keep blood from pooling to the to the lower extremities, and it would keep it more in your head and up around the eyes. With the anti G stringing suit, I was able to to keep my tunnel vision thirty percent or less up to nine Gs. I was also able to look back over my shoulder as if in a dog fight, looking at the enemy at nine Gs and so on. So uh, here's a, a, a situation where we're doing a test profile. We go from three to three and a half Gs of there, about up to six Gs, up to eight Gs, and then nine Gs. The result of that came, came to what's called the, it's called the hook maneuver now. We called it the hit maneuver because the straining process that was developed, and I, I didn't talk about that, there's this particular uh, breathing scheme that we were taught to use that the physiologist developed. When you execute this, this, this uh, breathing scheme, it sounds like you're saying the word hook, the hook maneuver. That's what we called it. Okay, well, it's still used now by the Navy and the Air Force. Some, some services call it the HIC maneuver, some call it the hook maneuver, and so on. But it's a high G stringing maneuver that we developed at a Navy lab that I was the first test subject to, uh, to, to participate in. <coughs> Excuse me. Fast forward. I'm at NASA, and uh, I'm on my first space flight. And one of the tasks that was assigned to me was test development of, of the actual EVA suit itself. Excuse me just a second, I'm gonna take a drink of water. <laughs> NASA was preparing to build the International Space Station. Initially, Russia was not a part of the space station. I think you all know the space station is up there now, been up there for 20 years. Russia is one of our partners. Initially, Russia was not a partner. And the space station was going to, build, going to be built at an inclination of 28.5 degrees. Well, when Russia became a partner, NASA had to move the location of the station to an inclination where we could reach it from North America, but Russians could also reach it from their launch base. 
this location in space was colder than we had traditionally done. So NASA had to modify the EMU, the extravehicular mobility unit of a spacesuit. NASA had to modify the spacesuit to handle extremely cold temperatures. They made the modifications. They put it on the flight in front of me, ahead of me. The astronaut put the suit on, went outside to test it, got so cold, he had to terminate the test, come back inside. NASA modified the suit again, put it on my flight, and it was my assignment to go out and test the suit. So on a night pass, and you, and you, pro you all probably know when we were in orbit, we circle the Earth every 90 minutes. So you've got 45 minutes in direct sunlight, and you're hot followed by 45 minutes in darkness in your cold. On a night pass in darkness, 45 minutes, I had to mount myself on the sill of the space shuttle. They rotated me towards deep space to get me as cold as possible. And then I had to activate the various devices on my suit to uh, determine whether or not they would keep me warm. I had thermal socks. I had battery powered gloves. Battery powered gloves are, are a common thing nowadays. You can you can buy them to go hunting with or fishing or hiking, but back then they were new, especially space gloves. I also had what's called LCDG bypass. Underneath my space suit is a liquid cooling and ventilation garment. The liquid cooling and ventilation garment of the LCDG is meant to help control my body temperature when I'm on an EVA. And what it does is, act, is actually actively cool you, okay? The, the problem in space is not so much staying warm, it's staying cool because the suit is so well insulated that you can build up a heat load. So the LCVG is an active cooling system. Well, if we're going to use the suit in an extremely cold environment, we don't want it cooling us. We want it warming us. So they implemented a system called LCVG bypass, where you bypass the cooling function of the liquid cooling cool. ventilation. So uh, I'll try to wrap this up so we can talk back and forth. We're getting ready to start a night pass. I'm on an EVA. It's time for me to get in position. So I work my way up to my position. I bolt my, my feet into foot restraints on the sill of the space shuttle. I have a thermal cube mounted right next to me. The thermal cube would sense radiation, calculating air temperature, and they rotate me toward deep space. I'm standing there. I'm in sunlight. I can feel it. I look over my shoulder and travel at 17,500 miles per hour. I can see the darkness coming. So I'm in sunlight, I pass through the Terminator, that little gray area between night and day, and then within seconds, I'm in total darkness. And instantly, I can feel the chill begin to build up down into my suit. So I activate my thermal glove, my, my uh, battery-operated gloves, I activate my LCVG bypass, mm -hmm. and then I have a scale on, on my arm that I can use to rate the suit every so many minutes. While I'm being cold soaked, I also have a device on my sleeve, which is electronic cuff checklist. Believe it or not, in orbit, we still carry some paper. So this was the first experimental electronic checklist. I had to evaluate that, how well I could manipulate the data, how well I could, what was the font size, what was the, the, the color scheme, the clarity, and so on. So every few minutes, I evaluate the cuff checklist, and I evaluate the suit's, the suit's ability to keep me warm. 45 minutes after that test starts, I can look over my shoulder again. The terminator comes by, that little line between night and day, and then, then a few seconds later, I'm in bright sunlight again, and instantly I can feel the heat begin to build up inside of my suit. So I deactivate my battery gloves, I turn the LCBG bypass off, and give NASA a thumbs up, and, and, uh, and it, we had a successful test on that suit. That suit is the same one that astronauts are using today when they conduct spacewalks. And had it not been for those tests, not, not for me personally, but the, the, the design changes that they made that I had the privilege of testing, the astronauts would not be warm enough to conduct EVAs in, uh, uh, as they currently do from the space station. So those are just a few examples of some of the uh, opportunities that I've had to experience during my airplane days and my space days. At this point, Jason, everybody else, let's open up the floor and I'd be glad to have some two-way conversation with uh, anyone who has some comments or some questions. Yeah. Thank you, Winston. Okay. Um, 
let's see, maybe best, okay, uh, Kyle here, maybe first best just to um, put your name in the chat window and I'll just call on people sequentially, but Kyle, all you. Sure, so uh, thank you very much for coming to speak with us tonight, Captain Scott, I really appreciate it. Um, hey, hey, hey. If, you, if you don't mind, tell me who you are, where you are, what you do. I mean, are you, are you a graduate student or undergraduate, a doctoral student, a researcher? Welcome. Tell me a little bit about yourself, each person, please. Sure. So my name's Kyle Foster. Uh, I've been with this program for five years. Uh, I have a full-time day job in remote sensing, and I'm also a PhD student at George Mason University. Fantastic. Uh, so I'm taking the, the underwater EVA testing course through IIAS. And I'm curious, what differences did you note between the EVA suit used for underwater testing and the EVA suit actually in situ in the shuttle payload bay? Yeah, there, there are differences. And of course, the differences are not so much what you feel. The differences is in the reaction of the suit to the environment. The environment is the biggest difference. Uh, uh, let's back up. Both suits weigh about 300 pounds, 350 pounds or thereabout. The suit in the water, of course, is kind of a crude imitation of the real suit. It's not self-contained. You've got this big tether attached to it that bumps oxygen to you and so on. But the biggest difference is that in the water, underwater, you're still in 1G. Now, the divers, you may know the scuba divers are underwater with us when we train, and they weigh the suit. They actually place weights on you, around you body so that the suit is mutually buoyant. So the water sort of floats the suit, you pretend you're weightless, but you're really in 1G and you feel like you're in 1G. The other thing is underwater, the water stabilizes the suit. So when you, you're moving and you want to stop, the water helps you. Okay, in space, you don't have that stability from the water and you have to control your movements a lot better because every movement you stop, you start in orbit. You have to stop. So you have to, to control your your motion a lot better in space than you do underwater. The the EMU, the real EMU in space, is a lot better. It's a high fidelity because it's the real thing. I mean, the, the when you throw switches, they actually work. You go through your startup, your test, your pressurization, depressurization test, you look at your read your parameters. They all work. Whereas underwater. You just sort of pretend to go through all those things while you're wearing this big and bulky, bulky suit. So one of the big challenges, as you all probably know, is how do we develop newly designed suits that do the job of keeping us safe and keeping us healthy, keeping us alive, but also are a lot lighter, a lot less massive, and a lot more comfortable. Uh, so that, that's one of the, the, the questions that, that we continue to wrestle with. Thank you right. so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, let's see, next up, uh, uh, Matt is our uh, lead instructor for our EVA 105 course, and he's calling in from uh, Poland. All right, Matt. Yeah. Hi, hi from hi. Europe. It's around 2 a.m. right now. So. <laughs> Uh, Winston, uh, I had an amazing uh, opportunity to meet you in person and you also, um, we attended also your talk at KSC and you invited us to astronaut, uh, astronaut room and I have uh, amazing autograph of you. But oh, my okay. question is, yeah. uh, it was three, four years ago, uh, but I have a question for you. Uh, it's more technical uh, in part. So uh, during your EVA trainings in no neutral buoyancy laboratory, or web, uh, you also tested some equipment and tools and uh, you answered the question about the suit, but could you please ask, tell us more about the evaluation of the suit, uh, evaluation of the, of the uh, equipment which is going to be used on, uh, on, uh, on board of the uh, space shuttle and later on on the ISS for uh, for uh, maintenance and uh, some other stuff, but what uh, what are the considerations? What are the designs? And what are the similarities between the tools uh, that you use underwater and then later on on orbit? Okay. Yes. Well, there's so many different tools. I could talk all night long and not talk about each specific one. I'm trying to think now which one should I 
focus on. Let, let me let me pick one that that it is familiar with everybody. It, it's called a pistol grip tool, and what it looks like is an electric drill that you may have in your tool kit or electric screwdriver. It you grip it like a pistol, you pull the trigger, and it spins around. You can drive bolts or screws or whatever. We have one that's called a pistol grip tool because it fit like a pistol, obviously. But the thing that's so advanced about it is that uh, it, it's battery powered, obviously, but you're capable of, of really high torque with this thing and driving bolts. And of course, your gloves, the gloves are big and bulky and they're also pressurized. So the tool had to be designed so that a person could handle that tool with big, bulky, pressurized gloves, but also adjust the tool. There's a, a, a on the front of the barrel, let's look at the, the barrel, it's where you adjust the torque. And say you want to adjust the torque to 30 uh, inch pounds or maybe five foot pounds or whatever. You set the torque up here and then say a bolt needs so many turns, say it needs 15 turns. You can select the number of turns that you need. You insert the, the tool on the bolt, you pull the trigger and just hold it. And it will automatically count 15 turns and torque that bolt to 30 inch pounds or whatever you need. Now, the other thing that you have to consider in space is that for every action, there is an opposite, an equal and opposite reaction. You know this. If you don't anchor yourself when you turn that pistol grip tool and the torque tightens up, one of two things will happen. Either it will spin out of your hand if you're not holding it tight enough, or just like on the cartoons on TV, you spin in the opposite direction. So those are all kind of things you have to consider. Some little things you don't think about is that everything in orbit has to be tethered. The pistol grip tool, I would take out of it, I would mount it on my suit in the airlock before I ever exit the airlock. But inside the airlock, it's tethered in its container. Now, when I want to acquire the tool and, and take it from its container in the airlock and put it on my suit, the procedure is for me to take a hook, a, a, a tool hook is on a payout tether, and I will hook the pistol grip tool, then remove its inner cable, and then take the tool out and mount it on my tool ring and lock it down. So the idea is that you always have something tethered because as you know, on occasion, things have floated away and you don't want that to happen. So the handling of the design of the tools uh, has to be different. Uh, a lot of automation has, has to be there. Uh, the, the, and uh, something else you have to think about too, it, when they're designed and developed is that the outgassing. Tools have to be made from material that has to be processed before going into orbit. So the, the material is outgassed so that when you get into the vacuum of space, it doesn't give off dangerous gases and fumes and things like that. So there's so many considerations that have to go into the design of the tools. And the design of the tools is sometimes driven by the suit itself. If we can develop suits that are uh, more dexterous, are, are friendly to us and, and how we handle it more comfortable, we can make tools that are more usable, user friendly towards us. So I, again, we had some all kinds of uh, tools up there. Tell you one other thing that's interesting. This is, is it's kind of trivial, but it's very important in orbit. On my first flight, one of the things that I had to, to test was connectors, just kind of cable connectors. And some of the connectors were, were small, you know, maybe an inch or two around. The biggest one was like a fire hose. It was several inches in diameter. And uh, they were bayonet connectors, kind of like the fire department might use. You hook something together, then you have this big latch. You throw this latch over and it all latches together. Well, when you run an electrical cable in, in your house at home, it's no big deal. You just take an extension cord, you plug one end in, you move the other one in, you plug it in someplace else in space. It, it takes on a whole new dimension because in the cold of space, those cables could, could become so stiff, you can't manipulate them. The bayonets could become so stiff, you can't manipulate them. Uh, so anyway, I had to test making and breaking connectors of various uh, uh, cables of various sizes. Everything again from maybe a half inch cable up to about five or six inch cable. Off gassing is very important in development of those cables. The material has to be cured in such a way that you get minimal stretch. The uh, cables are wrapped in thermal material so that you can you try to stabilize the temperature of the 
cables as much as possible in space. One of the things that we did not expect when I was testing those cables in a cable box, okay, it's a big box that had a lot of connects like cables. At the end of the EVA, they discovered that my gloves had become chafed. It did, fortunately, they wouldn't, didn't wear completely through, but the knuckles had actually worn out. Now, that's a dangerous situation. It was something that we did not expect, but we saw it, and it's something that had to be dealt with in future EVAs, because obviously you don't want an astronaut uh, tearing uh, his or her gloves in orbit, making or breaking cables or using tools. So just as tool safety is here uh, important here on Earth, tool safety is just as important there in space. And there's so many things that come out that you did not anticipate. So I hope that gave you a good answer, but cool stuff happens in space. Thank you very much, sir. Hey, thank you. Good to see you again. <laughs> Okay, listen, uh, next up, uh, so Shauna Pandya, you probably might remember, she's uh, one of the members we call Barnacle. She's been around since the very first year and our head of our operational space medicine group. All right, good, good to see you again. Yeah, nice to, nice to see you, um, Captain Scott. Thank you so much for your time. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm a physician, I'm in Canada, I'm actually in clinic right now. Um, and I was in the same ground school class as Kyle who just asked this question and I'm lucky enough to be taking um, Matt, who just asked his questions, EVA 105 class, as well as the FTE class. So it's a lot of fun. Um, so mine has to do with, my question has to do with surface EVA. Um, when sorry, we're looking at evolving capability, oh, so ahead. my question has to do with surface, surface EVA in the Artemis era. When we're okay. looking at evolving contingencies uh, and crew dynamics, um, for surface EVA, obviously the nature of the work and perhaps the risks are a little bit different. Um, so based on your experience, what would you like to see as either um, an evolution or a new selection criteria or a new training um, um, aspect to uh, maximize success and minimize risk for surface EVA, either from crew dynamics um, or for contingencies um, on surface EVA? That's, that's a lot of question. I'm gonna, I'll see if I can condense that Perfect. and just and that's a little bit, no, that's a good question. There's a lot, a lot to it, a lot of aspects to it. I, I don't think the difference in surface EVA versus what I did in orbit is, is the, the driving factor here. I think what's important, uh, a per, what, what's important in the evolution of EVA and EVA equipment would pertain to both, to both surface EVA and EVA in orbit. I think the and 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 first and foremost, we got to develop better spacesuits, spacesuits that are again uh, lighter, uh, less bulky, less massive, and more form fitting and more comfortable. That will allow more people to be selected to do EVAs. Currently, our current suit eliminates some people because the people just can't handle all that mass and that bulk. The smaller statured people, men and women, small statured people simply can't handle that big bulky suit. So we make suits that are more user friendly, more people will be able to go out and do EVAs, be it on surface or in orbit. In terms of a, you know, EVA a suit design also, that's, that's really a driving factor. Surface EVA, one thing you have to be concerned with that we don't have to in orbit is, uh, is dust and dirt, good old fashioned dust. Because as you know, dust can be detrimental to the function of many things, uh, space suits notwithstanding. So that needs to happen. Uh, safety features uh, in uh, on the surface will probably be different. You gotta be able to navigate yourself around. And some of that navigation needs to be in the suit itself. Because if you wander away from your vehicle, say you're, you, you, you took a, a ride in the, the surface vehicle, and then you're doing EVA and you wander around, maybe now nightfall comes and you can't, you gotta be able to find your way back, okay? Uh, whereas in the space station, you're always in the vicinity of the space station. So there needs to be some kind of navigation gear or some kind, I, I think, uh, in, in, in the developed of the suit. I would like to see a uh, voice command of the suit. If I want to pull up a certain spec or a certain procedure, I just tell the suit, say I'm EV1, and I could say uh, EV1 procedure for such such, and then it will be displayed on my heads up display on my helmet. So voice and I can control, heads up display, navigation, communication improvements, and so on. Uh, uh, in orbit, we have to be concerned with micrometeorite protection, you know, and you probably know the 
hard upper torso of our current suits is made out of Kevlar. So the bulletproof vest material. And the idea is that if you hit by micrometeorite, the Kevlar will protect your vital organs. Uh, likewise, suits on the surface are gonna have to be able to provide some kind of protection for you. Micrometeorites may or may not be as much of a problem as they are in orbit, but we need to identify what the hazards could be on a surface EVA and be able to protect from those too. So I kind of go on and on and on and give you some ideas of some things that I think ought to ought to be happening. But first and foremost, it's a suit that will fit more and more people and much more. So cool, cool stuff. Thank you so much for that. That was awesome. Uh, you're so welcome. Thank you. Hey, so, well, next up we have Aaron Prasad. Dr. Aaron Prasad is our director of bioastronautics, and I'm sure he's got a a detailed question for you. Okay. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, hello, uh, Captain Scott, real pleasure to meet you. Uh, I think we've tried several times to get you onto our parabolic flights, uh, but I guess scheduling hasn't worked out, but the offer is still open <laughs> if yeah, you would yeah. like to join us. I'd like to take you up on that as well as visit your EVA, your underwater facility, and uh, some of the high altitude airplane stuff you're doing too. Hopefully that works out. Yeah, fantastic. We look forward to it. So as Jason said, my name is Aaron Prasad. I'm currently in Boston. I'm a research scientist at MIT. I do work in generally in space science for the past 16 years, uh, but more and more recently I've been working on filtration technologies, now technologies, recover water, that sort of thing. Um, and I, I just had some comments and, and a question as well. So the, first of all, I have with me um, water a water cell that flew with you on sts 87 it was oh. part of the gas can experiment yeah. and it was in the shuttle uh uh bay area uh -huh. so while you were doing your pay, your spacewalk this fluid experiment was being done right behind you so which i thought we might that? get a... which one was that again so this was called the configuration fluid experiment and it okay. was in the getaway it was in the getaway um special getaway express space. canister right. yeah right okay yeah. Uh, so this is one of the experiments I would love for you to do on the aircraft, parabolic aircraft, uh, when you fly with us. I think there's a, <laughs> it, it, the history would just be so fantastic to have you do it. Uh, well, just, the, just, yeah. just to jump in, that's probably one that we had no interaction with. It probably it was either self-contained yes. or you got controlled it from the ground. But uh, Yeah, anyway. it was self-contained. It had a little solar cell on top and yeah, absolutely. Right. And we got some great data from that. Love to share that Good. with us. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Great. Cool. So you mentioned the um, the centrifuge facility in Warminster, and I actually had a chance to visit that as well. And I thought it was so interesting how huge it was. And yes. a, a little tidbit I got from that was that when NASA had built it, they had no idea what the human body could withstand. So they built it for 40, 40 Gs <laughs> at the time. Um, <laughs> but toward the facility, I saw that there were these... Um, these body prints uh, basically they, they did molds of some of the the candidates like we saw the mold for alan shepherd and so on so i was curious when you when you went in that facility or when you fly on these you know high g aircraft are, are is the seat in a way molded specifically for you i'm very curious about that no no the seats are not molded and as you know modern day uh seat material uh can support you give as necessary and then bounce back, but it has to be built to handle more than one, a different people. In other words, when I, when I flew fighters, uh, the, the plane had to be built such way that any pilot could fly it, regardless of size or body shape. So they weren't form fitted, so to speak. And the, the centrifuge, the centrifuge work that I did uh, replicated a fighter airplane. So we had a simulated ejection seat in there, but the seat cushion and seat back and so on. The, uh, the seat cushion and seat back inside a fighter plane contains survival gear and contains radio, contains a life raft, contains all kinds of stuff. It's not just the old seat cushion like you have in your car or your truck. That thing is packed full of equipment. So it has to have uh, the, the appropriate soft material over to, to absorb the, the, the G's and make you comfortable, but it also has all of this survival equipment built into it. Also, the seats will will inflate and deflate depending on how much G you pull. You actually get air blowing into the seat to to to, to firming up, but keep, but keep it pliable, and then the air will will come out. So the the seats are really really smart seats. No form fitting uh, like you like you might see on the 
the Twilight Zone on TV, one of those old old movies. So <laughs> great, thanks. But, and you're right that uh, the old centrifuge is built for 40 G's. I think you all know the human body could not withstand. You would perish long before you got to 40. <laughs> I was curious to know what were the highest G's that you had pulled, and thank you so much nine, for the answers. Nine, nine G's was the highest. Yeah. Nine, I'm gonna tell you, I'll, I'll tell you, nine G's, it, it hurts. It's physically painful. Your straps, because I have my survive, my flight gear inside the centrifuge, so you have straps up here, you have your helmet on, you have all, but when those straps get to pull into your body at nine G's, you come out with welts on your body, and you're sore the next day. So the human body can only will stand so much before you begin to do some serious damage to it. Having done uh, parabolic flights, uh, you know, experiencing zero Gs for periods of 20 seconds at a time, and having done some centrifuges up to, I, I, we went up to about, about 6.5 Gs. I can uh, tell you I love the Gs more than the zero G. <laughs> it, it makes you feel I, alive. <laughs> I agree. Zero G and negative G is tremendously uncomfortable and, and detrimental to your health. We have, a, we have our doctors, our physiologists on board and they will, and they will tell you negative G is, is, is bad for you. The human body can, and can withstand a lot more positive G than negative G. And you can, the most G you can withstand is transverse. You know, that's why astronauts lie down to launch so that the G forces are transverse. Of this way, you can withstand a lot of Gs transverse, but not so, not as much positive and even less negative. Yeah, negative Gs are very uncomfortable. Bad juju. <laughs> Great, thank you. That's, that's really impressive. I didn't know it was up to nine Gs. That was uh, you know, the most we expose our, our new students in, I believe is four positive Gs. So uh, yeah, thanks for sharing that. So your next question is up from Catlett. Catlett is a, uh, a new member and volunteer for our Out Astronaut uh, Outreach Program. Fantastic. Hi, um, so my, like he said, my name's Catlett. I am a undergraduate physics and math student at the University of Texas at Dallas. And I'm not enrolled in either of the classes, but I found this event on the Possum Facebook page. So I'm grateful to be able to join you. So okay. I just have a quick, <laughs> I just have a quick question about emergency planning. Sure. So when you were testing the insulation of the new EBA suit, what was the contingency plan for if you lost fine motor control, like because your fingers got too cold? You terminate the test be, be, hopefully before they get too cold. Okay. If but no, but you're right. There are contingencies, and the contingencies are uh, if one astronaut becomes incapacitated, your buddy would have to retrieve you and take you inside the airlock, close the airlock up, repressurize, and save you. As you know, we always go outside in a pair. So my buddy was out there with me, and we actually practice underwater retrieving each other not, not a lot but we did one session where we have to one person is incapacitated in space the other person has to make their way over to that person unhook them or whatever and then move hand over hand while pulling their their compatriot put them inside the airlock close the airlock up and repressurize it when you're outside on eba and you know this you're on your own nobody inside can help can help the two of you so if your buddy somehow can't can't get you in, then you're having a real bad day. Yeah. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, that you mentioned that you found um, tears in your gloves. Kind of compounded that question for me because the tears did not penetrate the material. It was only oh. the outer layer, but fortunately, and uh, but we discovered that working with those cables tore that outer layer. So uh, a consideration for working in close places in the future had to be to allow enough clearance a lot to, to prevent damage to your suit while working with certain tools. That's, that's the idea. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, next up is uh, Sergey Yakimov, and he's a new member to our institute. Well, someone we hope to bring fully into this institute as soon as we can get past this pandemic, but before that, he's just been taking course after course with us. So, <laughs> Sergey. Uh, good evening, uh, Winston. It's nice to meet you. Good evening, sir. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm an aerospace engineer uh, here in LA, California. I do production for uh, satellite parts for one web constellation. Mm -hmm. And as Jason said, uh, uh, I'm uh, with uh, 
project possum since last year and currently i do flight test engineer class and i have a question um what uh, risk assessment was done for spacesuit testing in uh, in, uh, in uh, um, open space I, I heard you. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. You said what recent testing was done? A risk, a risk assessment was done for spacesuit space suit testing. Okay, when you when you said what recent assessment was, I'm, I'm you said not, risk assessment. Risk assessment. Risk assessment. Oh, sorry. Oh, risk assessment. Yeah. Well, you know what? It's hard to uh, for me to answer that specifically because the suits were designed and tested and the risk assessment was done by the designer and developer before i ever got there but i can certainly tell you that uh the the risk assessment well first of all the current design was built on previous designs so it was iterative all the way back from the early mercury space suits and then the first eva space suit which was done on apollo okay and the first one was, I can't remember, it was Ed White or whoever did the first spacewalk out of Apollo. And uh, they, they, they saw some issues then they had to, uh, to revamp those. So uh, come up to the, uh, the current spacesuit. Uh, the design was, was iterative. And the current design was, first of all, tested for integrity, for strength, for radiation control, and flexibility. And the final test, and the whole a whole lot of them would be vacuum chamber tests. That's where the the, the 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 real assessment would take place. And even though the suit has been assessed from an engineering standpoint, each individual suit is assessed prior to flight in the vacuum chamber. The suit come in generic sizes like large, medium, and small, but then within that range, your suit is tailored to fit you. Everything is tailored right down to the individual digits on your finger, okay? So once my suit is tailored to me, I spend two periods at least wearing my own suit in the vacuum chamber for a six hour period of time. I actually hang the wall in my suit in the vacuum for a six hour period of time. To be sure that the suit works well and works positively before going into, into orbit. So, I, I hope that kind of answers your question. Is there, you know, is, this, is there more to it that I need to elaborate? Sorry, can you say it again? I know. Can, you are breaking up. Can you say it again? Yeah, I've got so much echo. There's some echo coming back to me. Some feedback. Ethnicity or race was more associated with the virus. Okay. Are you hearing me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, now, yeah, there was an echo of something coming back from it. I, my, my question was, did, was my answer okay or did you need something else? Uh, I think it's, it's sufficient for now. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, uh, Listen, I think uh, next up is Rui. Rui has been a part of our program now for about five years and is uh, from Portugal. Um, really broadly knowledgeable about space internationally and, uh, and the current chair of our Space for All Nations outreach program. Okay. Hello, Captain Winston. Uh, what a privilege. And I must say hello from Portugal from across the pond. So I'm, all, I'm on the <laughs> West Coast but facing you on the east coast so well uh, i'm a geophysicist that. yeah well i'm a geophysicist at the university of porto uh here in portugal and i do research and uh, many of the techniques that were done uh, actually during the apollo surface missions so things such as the seismic techniques and the gravity and the magnetics so that that's more or less my field i have also a little bit of piloting experience and uh, my my question is along the lines of uh, flight testing. So my question is, um, what what would you consider the most challenging aircraft that you tested in terms of the systems and the complexity of the systems that you tested? Uh, I'm, I'm aware of some of the naval aircraft, but I'm not sure if you, which ones exactly would would, would you consider more, more challenging? Um, 
Well, dur during my day, the Navy's frontline airplane was the F-14 Tomcat. And mm -hmm. the F-A-18 the was coming online as a replacement for the A-7. So the, the Tomcat was the frontline fighter. And the original F-A-18s was fighter slash attack, but it was really designed to fill the light attack role. That's changed nowadays, of course. The, the F-A-18 Super Hornet is the frontline fighter, and it fills, fulfills both the fighter and attack role. But the uh, most sophisticated airplane of the day, and of that day, and even by today's standards, would be considered very sophisticated, was the F-14. The F-14 was an incredibly complex airplane when it, the complexity was achieved with technology of the 1960s and 1970s. Just old technology, but incredibly complex. And, and, and just to give you an idea of some of the complexity, first of all, the airplane could launch off an aircraft carrier and it could carry uh, uh, missiles to intercept cruise missiles, the Phoenix, and the Phoenix was a multi-shot missile. I have to be careful because it's, some of this is probably still classified. But with the Phoenix missile and the F-14, you could actually detect a particular number of targets. I won't say what that number is. Detect them all, track them all, shoot them all down at the same time without ever seeing them. That's how much complexity you had. The radar system was called the AUG-9, Airborne Radar Airborne Weapons Group, AWG, AUG-9, was the computer weapons control system. In addition to the Phoenix, you had the mid-range Sparrow. The Sparrow was a radar guided missile for dogfighting, but mid-range. Then you had the heat-seeking Sidewinder, which was a dogfighting missile, and obviously it was heat-seeking. All those missiles, but the Sparrow was computer-supported. The Sidewinder computer-supported only until launch, then you launch and forget it. And then you have a gun. You had a real-time gun sight, so the computer supported the real-time gun sight also. And you could lock a target up, track it, and the computer would give you a gun sight solution to fire the weapon. So you, you had all of this sophistication. The wings swept back and forth. That was all computer controlled. And uh, the, the various radar modes uh, were handled by the radar intercept officer in the back, but they were supplemented by, by computer. The data, the data processing of that day was very, very sophisticated to allow you again to, to detect, localize, track, and attack targets. I'm, I'm being real careful again because I'm talking classified stuff. But the your answer to your question is the most sophisticated airplane was the F-14 Tomcat. Now, by today's standards, the Tomcat will maneuver like the new airplanes, the F-22, for example, the Air Force F-22. is certainly a lot more maneuverable and uh, the sense of fusion is a lot better than it was back then. And those days I had to read data from each weapon and infuse it within my, my brain. But we got mm -hmm. sense of fusion these days that uh, will pull all that data together for you and give the pilot information as opposed to, to raw data. But uh, Tomcat was, was quite an airplane, it really yep. was. I hope that, that kind of answers your question. Yep, I had a part B to, to that question, which was, in, and then in which way do you think that your naval aviator experience enhanced or aided you when you uh, trained and were, you know, um, uh, qualifying to be an astronaut? Oh, yeah, no doubt about it, that my aviation experience, it helped. In fact, if you, if you take a look at it now, all of the, even the original astronauts were all military pilots. Okay. Now, we've gotten away from that nowadays. We have pilot background, we have scientists also. But uh, uh, flying in space is just like, it's a, it's a flying business. So people who come from flying backgrounds typically uh, do pretty well there. And you're flying high performance vehicles. A spaceship is a high performance vehicle. So what better place to come from than flying high performance airplanes? That's why all the pilots for NASA right now are still military pilots, they're the Air Force or Navy. Uh, Marines and naval aviators. And uh, even the scientists who come to NASA as astronauts, uh, some of them have airplane backgrounds, some high performance civilian airplane background. So the answer is that yes, my uh, naval aviation training was absolutely perfect uh, stepping stone to training in the space program. The space program was just a step up 
from what I was already doing in the Navy. So for people who want to become astronauts, I always encourage them to get some kind of flight background. You don't have to become a licensed pilot or anything. You, you know, you, if your discipline happens to be astrophysics, then certainly become an astrophysicist. But uh, I would encourage some kind of flight experience because flying in space is a flying business. And you don't want to get there and decide that you don't like to fly. You know, a flying makes you uncomfortable. Okay. But, but I, I would strictly urge that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Next up is uh, Nadia, who's uh, fairly new to our program and jumped right in with both feet. And she was up at the CSA doing our uh, uh, EVA spacesuit evaluations in, the, in Canada last. Um, hi, Captain Scott. It's so nice oh. to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, so as uh, Jason said, my name is Nadia. I am a clinical research scientist. I work on clinical trials here at the University of Calgary. Um, I did my class 1902 and we were looking forward to meet you, but I think you were you were busy that year. So we look forward to meet you in person. Um, my question, thank you. My my question is a bit naive, but I was just curious um, about the the 90 minute uh, trip around Earth, is the, the temperature shift so extreme that you have to adjust the temperature in your suit every 90 minutes? And if so, how much um, how much change? The temperature extreme, the temperature changes are relatively extreme. They're in the hundreds of degrees. And obviously it depends on specifically your orientation over the Earth, you know, what inclination you're taking. If you have a flat inclination where you're going kind of along the equator, then the temperature changes will be one thing, but if you have a high inclination where you're more, uh, or a little bit more polar, the changes are going to be uh, greater. Uh, in the sunlight, the temperature can be as high as say 250 degrees Fahrenheit, something like that. And then on the opposite side, you might get down to minus 200, a minus 250 degree Fahrenheit. We might not feel that, we may feel 100 degrees above and 100 degrees below as we swim, but, that the temperature the changes are extreme and uh, whether you the, the suit tries to automatically maintain the temperature for you but it's just like anything else uh, the way you feel depends on a number of things including your heat load if you're very busy on the back side of you're not going to feel the cool as much and you might not have to manually adjust your temperature if you're still for some reason you may feel extremely cool. You might have to manually adjust the temperature. So the idea, is, so the suit is designed to automatically do its best to maintain and stabilize your temperature. If necessary, you can manually adjust it. But that, okay. yes, yeah. Uh -huh. And yeah. The one, one last question is from your two amazing flights, what would be the highlight of, of your flights in space? You can oh, just choose high one highlight. Yeah. The highlights are just absolutely the EVAs. Yeah. If everything you do in space is just amazing. Even the mundane things like just eating, sleeping, living, uh, and exercising. But the highlight is when you put the suit on and go outside. That is just the, there's nothing else like it. So I wouldn't wouldn't trade that experience to anything in the world. Perfect. It's a pleasure to meet you, Captain Scott. Thank you so much. Thank you. Look forward to meeting you in person. Likewise. But then let me know if you're getting short on time here. Um, I'll just keep going through. We have a few more questions in the uh, in the hopper here. Lee Roberts is yeah. our new member here in uh, in Possum Class 2001, and then that was the one that was uh, cut short because of the pandemic. So we're hoping to get him into the program as soon as we can. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, Captain Scott. Hi. Uh, thank you for indulging so much of our curiosity. Uh, my um, pleasure. I, I work as a, a pilot for a uh, regional airline, and um, I am a space exploration enthusiast, and right now I'm taking FT 101. Um, and in that course, uh, a lot of what we're dealing with is uh, really quantifiable aspects of aerodynamics and aircraft systems mm -hmm. and things like that. I, I noticed in the experiences that you shared, at least two of the three, and to a certain degree, the third as well, uh, dealt more with human factors aspects. And can, can you just speak a little bit to uh, the differences of quantifying 
uh, subjective human factors uh, uh, measurements as opposed to aerodynamic or performance metrics. Yes, and, and, and as you know, as you can surmise, what makes it difficult in the human factors arena is the idea that it is subjective. What the, the, the sensations or the parameters that you're trying to capture are subjective. You know, what feels a certain way to me will feel a different way to other people. So one way to do this is to, is to take many, many, many subjects, okay? And then you average out their responses. Sometimes, you probably know this, sometimes you actually will run a subject through, say, a maneuver or test, and then you have that subject rated. And say, I rate this a five. Well, the next subject may rate it a six. The next subject may rate it a four, whatever. But over a long course, we can come up with a measurement that will actually rate that particular feeling. And it might be rated as a five. So that's one way to do it. Another way you can do things is, uh, is you measure them with, with, uh, with a device. Maybe you put an uh, accelerometer on there and, and you put, put the subject through this, this maneuver and the accelerometer measures uh, two Gs and we might equate that to some value. Then you run another subject through and let the accelerometer. So, so the idea is that you take these subjective things and assign objective values to them. Then you validate it over a number of subjects. You probably have been to the doctor's office. This is really crude, but I've been to the doctor's office and they'll have this chart on the wall and they'll have 10 faces, little round furry faces. And they'll say, what is your pain rating today? And it'll be from one to 10. And the little, you've seen this, the little circular face or a 10 will be real red and, and the face is turned down. And uh, a one may be a happy face. It's yellow uh, uh, and, and, and smiling. Well, that's a crude subjective way of quantifying something that is, uh, that, that, that is, is, is based on feelings. So if I got a number of subjects to come in and look at that chart and say they all had headaches and I asked them each to rate their headache, over a long period of time, I could quantify you know, what a headache feels like. So I don't know if that answers the question or not, but that's one way to do it. And that's why human factors stuff is so, is so difficult because it is subjective, but it is important that we quantify the, the subjective, the subjective aspects. Does that answer your question or is there, there more to it than, oh, am I not going to No, absolutely. And, and I think that your first example also relates into that because of the statistical analysis that was involved um, in, in trying to quantify what was going on uh, with your observations as, as opposed to the mechanics. So thank you very much. Right. You know, it's interesting, uh, this number of subjective things that have been quantified, for example, reaction times. You know, in the early days of uh, testing and, and ever, I guess actually investigation or testing or whatever in flight control uh, uh, development, it, we had to, not we, but, but scientists had to quantify the human reaction time. And I think we all agree now that the human reaction time is at least three seconds, three seconds or so, between the time something happens, the person sees it, they process it, and they react can be as, can be three seconds or so. But well, that's just, that's something that was subjective many years ago. But now we've quantified that over years. I think three seconds is what we. So it's really an interesting uh, in interesting entity, interesting phenomenon, and something that we're always, always working on. It's a lot more difficult than measuring uh, objective or physical phenomena, like how fast a vehicle is going, uh, how quickly it accelerates. You know, yeah, those are things pretty easy to, to measure, but the human side of it is really, really kind of tough. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Matt had a follow-on question, but he was also asking if you could recount a little bit your experience. And I know we talk about this a little bit in our book, but uh, recount a little bit of experience about catching the satellite on orbit. And, yeah. uh, and he was he was saying when he heard when he heard that story the first time, he thought he was wasting his life. <laughs> so I think it's just a great story all the way around, like how the whole uh, whole mission came about and uh, how you adapted in real time. And of course, we talked about the support of, of everyone on the ground working in the NBL, trying to figure out the recommendations to send up to you and how to get that satellite back. But uh, it's such a great story. And maybe uh, we could yeah. take a sec to share that. Sure. And that's, that's, that was one of those pivotal moments in a person's life, you know, when, when you when, when something is a, a situation has occurred and you got to uh, 
kind of step up and do it or shy away from it or whatever. But anyway, my Columbia flight, we took a uh, 3,000 pound solar observation satellite in the orbit with us. It's a Spartan 206. Actually, I said 3,000, 2,950 pounds. I always say 3,000. Anyway, our job was to use the robot arm on the shuttle to lift that satellite up out of the payload bay, place it in the orbit, initialize it, back away from it for 48 hours. It would make measurements of the sun's corona. Then we fly back up to it, use the robot arm to grab it and uh, deactivate it, put it into the payload bay and bring it home. And the idea is that scientists would download its data at the end of the mission and learn more about the corona of the sun. Well, during the deployment of the satellite, the satellite malfunctioned. Its attitude control system did not initially initialize properly, and the satellite began to, to slowly spin in space. That was a very, very slow turn because this thing was 3,000 pounds, about the size of a small car. It was turning very, very slowly. So we initially tried to match the turn rate with the shuttle so that we could grab it with the robot arm. If you can imagine something turning slowly and you're going to catch it with the arm, you got to match the turn rate. But every time we would fly out to it and approach it, it would all of a sudden sort of magically change orientations. We couldn't figure out what was going on in real time. We chased that thing around in space. We were burning up fuel. NASA finally said, OK, back away. Let's take a look at this. And over the next uh, several hours, engineers on the ground, on the console, analyzed its motion and determined that it was complex. So it would turn in one direction for a while and then undergo a mutation and a different direction, another mutation, different direction, another mutation. So it was a big slow motion, 3,000 pound wobble all over the place, which is why we couldn't catch it with the arm. It was decided that the way to get that satellite back was my buddy and I would go out on a spacewalk and try and catch the satellite manually. And it was a $10 million deal. So we couldn't just leave it up there as a piece of space junk. We had to figure out a way to get it back. So over the subsequent follow days, the ground crew, ground technicians kept analyzing its motion because we wanted to see whether the motion would dampen enough for us to handle it manually. Also, astronauts in the neutral buoyancy lab, along with the scuba divers, begin to simulate having a big old satellite spinning around and then the astronauts catching it and manipulating it and, and putting it into the payload bay. They would practice this underwater video it, send the video up to us in preparation for our big powwow. And meantime, on orbit, uh, NASA told us of the plan that uh, Takao, Takao Doi, Japanese astronaut, and I were going to go outside and try to manually catch the satellite. Now, I was the lead spacewalker. I was experienced. Takao was on his first flight, first spacewalk. And they actually left it up to me. They said, you know, it's up to you whether you do this thing or not. And of course, I wasn't going to back away from it. We were going to get it done. But in uh, some of the preparation we had to do in, in orbit was to pretend and to practice how we were going to go about doing this. So while they were analyzing things on the ground and practicing, Takao and I were practicing in orbit. We made a little satellite, a little satellite simulator out of a film canister, and we were spinning around in, in, in zero gravity. And then I would give the various commands as to what we were going to do. Uh, Takao, but being Japanese, spoke English as his second language. Now, his English was outstanding, but it's not the same as having another English-speaking person with you. So I had to practice the commands and practice what I was going to say to him so that I would not confuse him. We also had to define our directions. If I said move up, did that mean move up out of the shuttle bay? Or did that mean move up towards our our face. And when I said move forward, does that mean move for a roll a roll it forward, a roll left and right? I had to be very specific. I couldn't just say let's rotate the the uh, uh, satellite left or rotate it right. We had to I had to say up out of the bay or down into the bay, a uh, move port towards you or starboard towards me, and so on. So we had to define all of our communications to be sure everything was. Uh, there was no room for any confusion. So long story short, after two or three days, the powwows, the, the videos, the practice on orbit and so on, to, uh, came the morning of a spacewalk and we were going to, to uh, get the satellite. Takao and I exited the uh, payload bay door and we went out and we perched ourselves on the sills of the space station. I was on one side, he was on the opposite side. We locked our boots in the foot restraints 
to hold our body still so that we have both hands free. Our commander flew the rendezvous up to the satellite and then we stopped and paused and we were watching it again because we wanted to determine whether or not the uh, motion had dampened enough that we could catch it. Finally, we, we, we moved us up to within arm's reach and then I took over and, and guided him as to where the, to place us. And I can remember watching and, and the satellite might drift aft in the payload bay for a little bit. So I'd say Kevin, Ke our commander was Kevin Kriegel. Kevin, the satellite's about five feet aft. Okay, so he moved the, sh saddle, the shuttle back. I said, hold. Okay, you need to move us up about three feet. He moved us up, okay, hold. Now you need to rotate the shuttle port. You need to rotate starboard or whatever. Finally, we got into position. NASA gave us a go. Mission Control gave us a go. And we reached up and uh, grabbed the satellite. It's really interesting. Here's this big thing floating in space, weighing nothing just floating there. But as soon as I grabbed it, I could feel all of that mass, 3,000 pounds of mass. So in space, you can separate weight from mass. I grabbed my end to Cal grab his end. Then we had to adjust our grips to, to get to a place where we could manipulate the thing. And then very slowly, I gave the various commands and we rotated the satellite forward into a particular or orientation and we locked into the payload bay and brought it home. Now, there's a whole lot more to it that happened that I'm telling you because it wasn't quite that easy. Some things went wrong that I'm not getting into. But uh, that was a, an interesting combination of teamwork of folks on the ground, folks in orbit, uh, good design work, because the people that designed the satellite built into it an emergency mode called minimal reserve shutdown. When a satellite malfunctioned, what happened was that the satellite shut down with the exception of electromagnetic torquer bars. They were electromagnets along the bottom of the satellite. They were activated. The electromagnetics interacted with the Earth's magnetic field and dampened its motion. Had they not had the foresight to build that, the satellite's motion might not have dampened enough for us to catch it. So we had that aspect going on. We had the aspect of people inside the, the, the shuttle working with us and and overall, it was a, a successful event. So I told you in a number of minutes what it took. Uh, the e that part of the EVA took about three and a half hours to do. But uh, we did get it. We brought it home. It was repaired and sent up on a subsequent mission. So cool stuff. Yeah, I, I wasted my life. <laughs> I realized <laughs> I wasted my life. <laughs> Thank you very no, much, sir. <laughs> not at all. You may, you may be on Mars and walking around here in a few years. <laughs> Winston, I have a question, and I think it also dovetails into what uh, Kyle wanted to follow up on. With our EVA 105 course, we have a uh, an NBL facility, and uh, under under Chris's leadership, we build a uh, an airlock mock-up to evaluate suits and procedures outside. And you know, we have a, a lot of drawings that go to making that Quest airlock and you know, we understand conceptually what the knobs and dials on the inside panel mean, but if we might be able to take a few minutes and just share what it's really like to operate inside of an airlock and the procedures, uh, Kyle brought up the topic of pre-breathing. Um, yes. when, when you hook up to the, uh, the umbilical interface and prepare to egress from an airlock, um, what things did you find that were a little different than what you had trained for academically? Well, uh, when you train underwater, again, you actually throw the, the switches out, well, some of them, and some of you simulate because they're not really there in the NBL. And also in the NBL, your air is supplied for you. So you're not really doing it for real. So when you get on orbit and you do it for real, it's really different. First of all, the airlock is tight. It is so tight. You have to coordinate your movements. And it's like a dance. It's like two people dancing inside of the airlock. If I'm going to move one, uh, if I'm going to move one way in the airlock, my buddy has to move the opposite way. If I'm going to flip upside down to flip some switches and he has to move back, he kind of help me. Work. So you're, you're literally banging around inside the airlock. In fact, astronauts inside the shuttle says it sounds like you're having a fight inside it. It sounds like you guys are inside just duking out because of all the banging and knocking going on. Uh, the controls on the real thing, uh, they are, well, they're just real. It, it's, it's, I, I don't know how, how I can explain that. They're not mock-up. You actually move the controls for real and they respond for real. You, when you move your, your uh, 
your pressurization switch on your suit, the pressure actually changes. You can feel it, you can hear it. And if you aren't careful, you might get it stuck in, a, in an intermediate position, like an unstick it, yeah, which something you didn't you didn't plan for because the neutral buoyancy lab mock-up suit doesn't have the real controls. So you you physically move them and, and, and you get a reaction from those controls. So it's just uh, uh, a matter of, uh, of practicing uh, the choreography the, and, and of, of movement and moving the controls as, as best you can in mock-up and then augmenting that with your real suit inside of the uh, vacuum chamber. That's one time you get to wear your own suit. So you move the controls and get used to it, but you're adapting to it on orbit. You're adapting when you get there. Another thing about doing it in space is you really feel the sensations. It's like the difference between flying a simulator and flying a real airplane. No matter how good the simulator is, it doesn't move and it doesn't smell and you don't sweat and you don't feel the G-forces and you don't feel the pressure, the accelerations. And um, and the discomfort, the sun beating through the canopy, you know, the wind blowing on you, bouncing around, there's just a whole lot of difference. And the same thing with uh, uh, an EVA in orbit as opposed to in the neutral buoyancy lab. You get all of the sensations in orbit that you don't get in simulation of, of the lab. But uh, it's fun, it's exciting, it's challenging, uh, and uh, i just so fortunate to have been able to do it. Thanks, Winston. Uh, and we're hearing a hopper from Rick Blakeman. Now, he's another one of our barnacles. Good evening, Captain Scott. Richard Blakeman here, sir. I'm Hi, a, uh, how you doing? How is it going? I'm great. Uh, you were in Navy. I was Air Force and Army. So all good, right. good for all of us. Thank you for, for your service, sir. Uh, I'm also a uh, pilot. I'm a airline captain. I work at the same place that Lee does, so uh, do a lot of flying and uh, but my co and some research and things of that nature. And what, what, I, what, aircraft, what aircraft do you fly? I fly the uh, Embraer E-175. Okay. All right. Cool. You both fly 175s? Affirmative, sir. Okay. Great. They're good airplanes. Embraer makes some good machines. You know, we have Embraer. I'm in Melbourne, Florida. Mm -hmm. Embraer is right here at uh, Melbourne Airport, and they produce the Phenoms here. Okay, I'm familiar with yeah. those. Yes. Uh, Never flew them, but I'm familiar with them. Yes, sir. Well, sir, I have. Uh, like I said I've been with the I've been with Possum, the Possum program, basically from the beginning. Uh, with Aaron and uh, Shauna and uh, Heidi and Kyle, and you know we're part of the. I was 1502. Part of the awesome 11 yeah <laughs> <laughs> but uh, i have a two point uh, two part question sir based on your experience uh when you're talking about basically adapting to uh unusual circumstances during your uh, satellite recovery during the manual satellite recovery due to the unexpected perturbations of the uh, satellite what are the most effective ways from your experience to send up new types of procedures to the crew and trying to simulate that both for orbital experiences and also for long-term dura long duration space flight uh, in flight simulation mock-up using a compute sending a mission control sitting or mission support sending up a uh, computerized simulation or virtual reality or what from your experience what would you suggest or what well, are your recommendations? Well, both, those things are always evolving. I mean, we want shuttle. They would send up new procedures for us electronically, obviously, and we can actually print them out on orbit. Okay, we could print them. You can read on the screen, but you also print them out and you can discuss them. Uh, well, nowadays you send them up electronically, but you can send computer to computer. Uh, sometimes you may be able to send the uh, procedure itself from one machine to another machine that's going to execute it and kind of eliminate the people all together except for monitoring the thing or, 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 uh, or uh, uh, activating it. Uh, we, we had virtual reality capability on the ground, of course, but we didn't have any virtual reality capability in space. That's coming, obviously, and uh, it may be a, that may. So the way, if I understand the question right, I think the best way to send up 
new information is by whatever the best means happens to be at that time. And that's always improving. Uh, so I, I'm not that sure that answers the question or not. I can foresee the day when uh, an EV or a procedure would be sent up from Earth. And I'm say I'm on the moon, I'm doing a, a, a ground EVA on the moon and they need me to do some kind of procedure. They'll send it directly to me or to my suit and I could call it, it may it may talk to me. It may walk me through with a voice what they want me to do. I don't have to read it at all. And uh, kind of like my car, my uh, navigation, my car gagging me along. Or I might I might interrupt the procedure as it's talking to me and said, I might say it may say uh, configure a cable according to page six unit one and a figure one. And I may say, Hall, oh, show figure one and it to display it for me on my heads up display. So my point is, that I think the best way to do this is whatever technology exists at the time that can give the crew member the best information. And I want to emphasize information over data because you probably know this, but older airplanes or older vehicles would give us a lot of data and then we have to extract that data in form. A of lot picture. of feedback. Yes. That's right. But what I'd rather have is the information, not the data. The space shuttle itself was an incredible vehicle, but it was heavy, heavy data on the displays. And that's, but that was what was, was available at the time. My Tomcat gave me a lot of data, but what I want really is information with the ability to dig down into the underlying data if I wanted to. So the number of ways that, that information could be given to you, something, some things may be best conveyed to me uh, tactile. Say I'm doing an EVA on, the surface of the moon. I'm walking around and uh, say my, my suit, uh, I, it is a fault in my suit. I might not want a red light to come on or a voice to come on. Maybe it, maybe it's a, a minor fault. Maybe the suit will tingle. Or maybe the suit will touch me or something like that. Or maybe the navigation in the suit might not be vocal. Say we're, we're talking, I'm doing EVA and we're having conversation. Well, I don't know, I don't want another voice coming over my headset navigate telling me where to go to navigate maybe i navigate by tactile functions the suit touches me in the back telling me to go forward the suit touches me on the left side telling me to go that way and and so on i actually flew an evaluation on in a simulator on a tactile suit it was developed by a, a navy captain physiologist and uh the suit would vibrate in certain places and and you could respond to it I actually flew a simulated instrument flight successfully through a maze on a simulator simply by using that tech, tactile sensation. Oh, so, so you would get steering commands from the tactile situation. Uh, that's uh, right, but. from the tactile situation. Okay. It, I mean, it, it worked well enough that I could, sit, I could fly this airplane through a maze in simulation using only the field. So wow. the answer to your question is that it depends on the situation, it depends on the, the, the technology available at the time, and it depends on the, the level of uh, priority of the information to be sent. All of those things could be pre-planned and pre-programmed and, and, and you go accordingly. Artificial intelligence, AI could be employed to determine what the best way to, to get a, a piece of information across to the crew. And as we become more and more sophisticated, there become more and more and better ways to get information up to us. I hope that, that answers the question. Very, it, it does. Uh, my the, my second point. This my second part on this is is a, a quickie, but uh, for unexpected situations, not only for orbital operations but for long duration space flight, uh, what kind of uh, skill cross training did you folks do, insofar as having multiple skill sets in case somebody was incapacitated or somebody had an issue or you needed additional help, where there were skill cross training involved. Yeah, we, we did some, not a lot, because uh, in my, of course, we're still in lower orbit, and mm -hmm. in my day, the shuttle was even shorter duration vehicle, so we were up there for two weeks, you know, space station folks up there for six months now, but we, we're still close to home, so we haven't gone off in new directions, but uh, the space station folks do a lot more cross training and skills than we did on the shuttle. Uh, everybody on the shuttle had particular things that they're responsible for, but very little cross training. Uh, in in my particular cruise, because I was a pilot by background, I did some pilot training. 
you know, I, I went through all the rendezvous training like the shuttle pilots, mm-hmm. even though I was an EDA person. So the idea was that if something uh, had happened to the commander, then you the, had your piloting skills, so you'd still be able pilot to. Would, that's right. The pilot would move to the commander seat. I would move up to the pilot seat. So we did mm-hmm. that on my crews. Uh, nobody was back. There's no EVA backup. If something happened to one of us, the EVAs would have been scrubbed, for example. The robot arm operator, we had a primary arm operator, but our pilot was the backup arm operator. So there was some cross-training of skills, but but not a lot. Not as much as we see now in Space Station. The folks up there, you know, they're trained to, they might have flown the vehicle up there. And of course, it's a SpaceX vehicle these days. Um, most of that flying was automated. But the people that flew it up, they would also do an EVA. So in the shuttle, we can have the, the people who were piloting, who were assigned to pilot, did not do an EVA. You don't want your pilot going outside. So there was that division. No, and that makes perfect. And that makes, that makes perfect sense. You don't, you know, it's sense. like Captain Kirk. You don't want to evac. You don't want to send the whole bridge crew out into space <laughs> and exactly. leave them behind. <laughs> exactly. But uh, as we go off further distances from home and we spend longer and longer periods of time, obviously the cross training is going to become more and more important. You don't have to have more than one person capable of doing more than one thing. Uh, uh, in the engineering side of things, the uh, systems repair and systems operation uh, obviously becomes incredibly important. You got to have people who can who can do that kind of thing. On, in space and more than one person. Everybody has to be able to back everybody up. So it becomes more and more uh, diverse in, in training. It's cool, Thank cool you stuff. So much. Appreciate that. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Winston, I think Rick's wearing a very red shirt for uh, be, crit- be critiquing uh, Captain Kirk's selection of ground crew. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, it, it, the, the red shirt guys were unfortunately huh? <laughs> I was wearing Mars red tonight for uh, perseverance and ingenuity but yeah I guess you can I can you know expendable crew member number one reporting for duty. <laughs> that makes two of us I probably was expendable also speaking of uh, the Mars rover the, the helicopter we finally got the uh, the helicopter flying up there 40 seconds or thereabout so it's interesting stuff going on. Incredible. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, All sir. Right, uh-huh, thank you. Kyle wanted to follow up here. He had a he had a question about pre-breathing and uh, sure. EVA. Yes. Hey, Captain Scott, longtime listener, second time caller. So uh, we know that uh, there's different engineering challenges between life support systems for spacecraft and space suits. And so spacesuits often operate at different partial pressures and, and gas mixes and, and such. Uh, prior to EVAs, you may be required to pre-breathe. I'm curious about what your experience was with pre-breathing, uh, what your opinions are about it, whether we should change the way we, uh, we approach EVA prep on orbit, whether we should maybe dip the pressure of the entire spacecraft cabin or operate spacesuits at a a higher pressure to reduce the pre-breathe or does does the length of a pre-breathe give you time to do additional checkouts as you're prepping for an EVA? I'm, I'm very curious mm-hmm. about your insights on that. Yeah, let, let, let me back up to, to what we do now, what we do on shuttle and what they currently do on station is there was a pre-breathe and, um, and I think every, everybody on, on the uh, call probably already knows that it's important to pre-breathe because our EMU, the space suit itself, is pure oxygen, whereas the air inside of the shuttle or station is just that air. It's a combination of oxygen, nitrogen. So before you go outside in a pure oxygen suit and a lower pressure, you want to pre-breathe to get all of the nitrogen out of your bloodstream to prevent you know, the bends, decompression sickness or whatever, the bubble, nitrogen bubbles coming out of solution and so on. So what we did on shuttle was actually begin the oxygen pre-breathe the night before the EVA. We would take an aspirin, aspirin sort of thins the blood and helps that process, and do a pre-breathe with just the mask on. And then we take the pressure inside of the shuttle from 14.69 of there about down to 10.2. So you take it down just a little bit to aid that pre-breathe process. The following morning, a couple of hours before the EVA is to begin, you don your suit and you complete the pre-breathe while inside of the suit. 
once you, oh, one of the things that we did was a new procedure that one of our EVA people came up with was actually exercising inside of a suit. Now, there are trade-offs. You only exercise and wear yourself out, manipulating that big suit. But you sort of actually flail your arms and legs around and get the heart rate up. And that aids in shortening the pre-breathe process. So we finish our pre-breathe. We're on 100% oxygen. And then we gradually take the airlock pressure down. As it comes down, the suit begins to maintain pressure. The suit pressure was maintained at 4.5 4 PSI inside our e e EMUs. That's a trade-off also because the higher the pressure, the more difficult it is to work in the suit. But the lower the pressure, the, the more you become a, a physiological risk. So our suits are at 4.5 PSI. I believe the Russian suit was a little bit lower than that. Some of you guys may know what the Russian Orlans were, but uh, 4.5 PSI was where we kept it. So in answer to your question, yeah, I, if there's a way that we can shorten the pre-breathe, we certainly want to do that. We can't take the suit at much lower than 4.5 or you run the risk of, uh, of injuring somebody. You don't want it higher than that because, well, obviously it makes the suit difficult to work in. So everything is a series of trade-offs. Uh, I don't think the solution is to make the suit an air suit, that is nitrogen, oxygen, as opposed to just pure oxygen. I think the oxygen is the way to go for a number of reasons. You have a single gas, you can recuperate some of the carbon dioxide you breathe out over lithium hydroxide canisters. So there are a number of reasons why I think pure oxygen is the way to go. But, uh, but uh, you, you, anyway, it, it, everything is a series of trade-offs. Does that, come back at me and see if that's, that's uh, adequate. You want to talk about that some more. Yeah, that, that's a that's a great answer, and I really appreciate your perspectives and, and your time. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think uh, before we leave this topic, I think the key, again, I, I've said this a number of times, the key is to reduce the bulk, reduce the mass and the bulk of the suit. I think that's the most important thing we can do so that the suit becomes easier to manipulate even at a particular, a particular pressure. That's important. Uh, probably the most important thing to do, and then ensure that the suit re retains its protective qualities. And this goes back a little bit to somebody asked a question earlier about the risk mitigation. I didn't don't feel like I gave that adequate attention. That the, there's so many risks involved with the suit. The basic risk is is it being able to sustain life from a physiological standpoint. But the other risk is being able to protect you from radiation. The suit has to do that. So you, and also to protect your eyes from ultraviolet radiation and, uh, and, so, and, and, and other uh, space radiation. The suit has to protect, I, I mentioned the fact that the hard upper torso that protects the vital organs is made out of Kevlar. Well, Kevlar is hard. It's like wearing a suit of armor. And Kevlar is unsuitable for the flexible part of the suit where you have to move your arms and hands. So that part of the suit is made out of seven layers of different materials. You got a couple of layers of a, of a stop tear, a couple of layers of metallized mylar. You got some neoprene rubber, some coverall. So you got to just get a big old bulky sort of mess on you that that is designed to provide life support and provide you with protection from the elements uh, micrometeorized radiation the temperature and so on so all of those things are done in trade-off and balance with one another to provide a protective environment so what else thank you, thank you. Uh -huh, thank you Listen, I got a respect for your time. I know we're coming up here towards uh, nine, and I, um, yeah. I think we could just kind of target that as a as a cutoff here. We got I think two more questions in the hopper, but also wanted to give you some time to, uh, you know, address anything to our community or ask any questions of us. Um, uh, should, should I press on with another question, or do you, should we just well, leave? You know, let's, uh, let, let me take another couple of questions, and then we'll be in the wrap up after that, if you don't mind. And then I Perfect. can. So, okay. Okay, we, we have a new member, George, um, who has uh, asked a question about Canadarm. 
Sure. Hi, Winston. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. It's really just amazing to hear you talk. And uh, Thank you. I am not currently a student with IIAS uh, or with Project Possum, but I do plan to get involved with this in the future. Um, I, uh, I'm wondering like, what your experience is with working with the, the Canada Arm or Canada Arm 2, and what are your thoughts on uh, like intelligent robots in the future increasing the, the safety of EVA missions on even on the surface of the, the moon and, and Mars? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can tell you, I was not an ARM operator. I, I, I did not have uh, real ARM training. I just sort of played with it a little bit in simulation. So I was not an ARM uh, specialist. And as you know, on a shuttle, we had a person assigned who was an ARM specialist. And then we had a backup person. Typically, the pilot would be the backup ARM operator. And uh, I can tell you, operating the ARM is a, an art and a science within itself. A good ARM operator's work is a her weight in gold. Uh, the Canadians are robotics uh, specialists. He has, he has just done a tremendous job. And uh, even the arms are on uh, station. The Canada arms on, on stations have just done a tremendous job. I think uh, my philosophy is that a combination of robotics and human uh, interaction is necessary. The robots are a part of our team. I use the term robots uh, as a generic term. Uh, on station right now, there's Robonaut. And Robonaut was set up some time ago, and I haven't followed exactly what's been done with Robonaut, but Robonaut is a humanoid-looking robot that was developed uh, there at Johnson Space Center and then sent up on orbit. And the idea is that Robonaut would be able to assist astronauts on performing certain tasks. So my philosophy is that we want a combination of human and robotic activities. We can send robots out perhaps as envoys to go ahead of us, and do certain things to prepare for us to arrive there, and then we go out and do it. I do not think we ought to stay home and send robots out as our replacement. I don't, I don't think we ought to do that. I think human exploration is who we are, and we as human beings should not be denying ourselves who we are and sit back home and just send robots out there. So uh, that's kind of my overall philosophy. As robots become more and more sophisticated, though, I think it's important that we ensure that we don't become the servant of the robot, that the robot always remains our servant. And if we aren't careful, I believe that could happen, you know, because they become so sophisticated, they become so quick. If we aren't careful, we relinquish control to the robots. Great. Now, yeah, let me give you a very, very simple example. This is a crude example. I go to the bank and I want to draw money out of the ATM. I put my card in. The most I can draw out is just say $300. Well, it's my money. But this machine is already telling me I can only have a certain portion of my own money. Here, I've relinquished control of my bank account to some machine. Now that's a really crude, simple example, but multiply that, uh, uh, magnify that to something on uh, in an airplane. I want to go a certain direction, but the airplane senses maybe a thunderstorm or whatever and says, no, you're not going to go that way. I'm not going to let you go that way. And there's nothing I can do about it. Well, I'm a human pilot. I mean, there may be a reason I want to go there. Okay, amplify that too. Now you're walking on the surface of Mars and you want to go do a particular thing, but the robot simply says, no, you're not going to do it. I'm not going to allow you to do anything. I'm in charge. I'll shut down your life support. Well, so I'm going on and on and on about this, but I think it's very important that as we go forward and we develop smart machines, uh, we can, that we always maintain control and not allow. And that we don't want to become servants to the machine. We want to always keep the machine as our servant. That's kind of my philosophy so something to think about perfect thank you so much winston thank you we are already getting a, a slew of 2001 references in the chat window here Winston. <laughs> that's, that's right last question and we'll just call this to the question and we can uh, work on wrapping it up uh, Stephen dare you had a uh, question on um training methods and how they've matured uh recently 
Uh, yeah, uh, pleasure to meet you, Winston. Uh, I'm, I'm working with UVA uh, 105 and uh, my interest is uh, human and robotic interaction. So, uh, you know, uh, speaking the language um, and, you know, hindsight, uh, Boeing with that AOA sensor failure, uh, yes. when does the, yeah, when does the robot start controlling things to a level where it uh, hinders human safety? Um, yes. Yeah, and you know, going off of that vein, um, I'm just curious, what, uh, to your knowledge, what have the major uh, uh, changes in training uh, have relating to simulations and hardware, specifically robotics, uh, kind of developed over the years since the shuttle, and um, how does that differ with everything that's been going on since the shuttle into the ISS, uh, um, you know, going past its uh, its scheduled retirement? Um, is that more because of the uh, the EVAs and uh, the capacity for that human element to uh, to keep forwarding the mission and uh, providing an improvement, or is it more the hardware side of uh, getting new systems up there to really increase its longevity? The the hardware side has not been the biggest change. The, the changes have been more on the procedures, more on skills and training the various skills more on learning to live in space uh, or, or long periods of time, more on conducting and testing certain things on orbit, small things like a 3D printing, for example, growing plants in space. So it's an extension of the stuff we were doing on shuttle. It's not so much so revolutionary, it's, it's expanding what we were already doing to learn how to do it long term and learning how to do it better. Uh, the, the introduction of machine, of, of advanced uh, intelligence and machinery has been a slower process than a change in the procedures to just learn how to live there and work there and sleep there and, and coordinate and so on. Does that answer the question? Am I on track with that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. So it really does sound like it's uh, the human versus the machine and the humans uh, out competing. Uh, <laughs> right. uh, yeah. Um, so in terms of procedures, what would you say have been the biggest changes since uh, your flights compared to what um, the crews are doing now? The, the biggest change has been the cross training, the more generic training. You know, astronauts grow up and, and each one learns to do a lot of different things, whereas we focus more on specific skills. For example, I just told you I never operated the robot arm. Well, astronauts today go up, you know, they they have both piloting skills, robot arm skills, EVA skills. So they, they're broadly trained and they can they can do a lot more variety of, of things than we do on shuttle. We were a lot more specialized on shuttle than they are today on, on station. Uh, so last question to that, do you think it's uh, uh, more flexible and safer because of that? Or uh, do you think it's too many uh, too many chiefs and not enough uh, recruits? No, no, I, I don't think it's that. I think the hierarchy of things, the hierarchy of organization is definitely there. I mean, you have a state space station commander. That person is in charge. And then uh, that person sets the tone and, set, and, and so on. Everybody follows that hierarchy. And I think it's necessary. Uh, I think it's a good thing that people have cross-trained in, in skills. I think it's necessary. It makes it all safer. It makes for a better team. Because remember, you're up there for a long time. You know, six months is a long time up there. And uh, you need a variety of tasks, a variety of people who can perform those tasks. If for some reason, one person can't do it, then you can't assign somebody else. But uh, but you mentioned uh, uh, the, the too many chiefs and so on. That brings me to an interesting point. One of the biggest challenges, I believe, to long-term space flight is going to be just that. It's the human part of it, people, the interaction of human beings. And uh, uh, so far, it has not been a big problem, even with six months on the space station. It hasn't been a big problem because six months is a relatively short period of time, I think. And also, you're very close to home. You're in low Earth orbit. But when we start sending people off to Mars, you know, that's going to be a three-year proposition. I think one of the biggest challenges is human beings and how human beings interact. The stresses that are, are in, involved in a three-year minimal journey like that when you're separated from Earth and, and your life uh, uh, literally depends on what happens up there. Uh, I think that's going to be a, a big issue. We can develop systems, you know, navigation system, for con, uh, for, uh, control system, propulsion, communications, but we don't understand people. And when the stresses get high and things start going wrong, you know, how does the crew 
interact with each other and uh, how does, does the discipline break down like you see on the science fiction movies the first thing that goes that happens when the ship spins out of control is everybody freaks out they get to arguing fighting and fussing and so on well you know so you know how do you train crews and how do you select people who can handle that that situation or uh, are you you trapped on mars your ship is damaged it'll be three four years before a rescue ship comes you know you know, how do you how do you handle that also they, something they, else they about, you know, on the bounty <laughs> uh mutiny on the bounty <laughs> how do you get the ship bits and rags? <laughs> absolutely also something else to think about is uh Say we go off to Mars, I guess a three-year trip, or, or, uh, or say we go into Mars with a permanent colony. How do you select people? What about male-female interactions? You know, people who go are, are in the prime of their lives. They're healthy, and you need male, uh, female, well, I say male-female, but you need interactions between people and their partners. It may be male-female, may, maybe not, but people and associated uh, physical and romantic partners. So how do you select people for that? Because your survival could depend. I mean, if, if people, if this, if conflict of some kind develops because of human interactions, that can jeopardize a mission and jeopardize safety. So something we, some things we need to be thinking about. The human psychological side of long-term spaceflight is very important. Well, Winston, I, I really appreciate. It. I want to give a particular want to give a particular shout out to uh, Rui and Anna and Matt and those that uh, set their alarm clock in the middle of the night in Europe uh, to tie in here. We are such an international organization that you know that we, we can never find a time that suits everyone. But uh, this has been a, a long, very special talk, and I think um, maybe a little bit different than the, the typical inspirational chats that you give. Um, and, in the remaining time, is there anything that you want to ask of this community or share with it or impart a little in broad inspiration to? And the only thing I will say is, first of all, I enjoyed it myself. Uh, I enjoyed meeting each and every one of you virtually, and I appreciate the opportunity to spend time with you. I hope that something I've said is is, is resonated with you. And uh, there's so many different topics. You can't dig as deep into detail as you, one might like, but I hope it was... Uh, it was good for you. I just wish each and every one of you the best of luck, and I would highly encourage you to, to stay with your studies, your pursuit of your space interests, because there's no telling where it may lead you. You know, it may lead one or more of you to space itself, or it may lead you to a, a space support mission, in a, a role in some way or another. But regardless, I think you already know how fulfilling it is to be involved in this business. So I salute you and I wish you all the best of luck. And I look forward to hopefully one day meeting uh, each and every one of you on a, on a personal basis. So good luck to you. And thanks again. Well, let's open invitation to any of our campaigns. And I'm sure that that's uh, some hopefully we'll get over this, this hump we're on this year and, uh, and can get on to um, some exciting research. So absolutely. All right. Well, if you don't mind, I'm going to say good night. It's, it's night for me. And uh, thanks to you all, especially the folks who be up in the middle of the night to, to join me. I appreciate it. Thanks Listen, so much. Thank you. Good night. Good night. All right. Really thank you. Take care now. Bye-bye. Uh, be safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a good night. <laughs> Have a nice evening. That was nice. And you could see the little pictures at the very end, just, you know, everyone saying good night. That was, that mm -hmm. was kind of nice. Now, all those. Thanks, yeah. everyone, for tying in. It's, uh, I think Thank we got through most questions. Happen, I know, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, I think you tied in just at the last second. I'm gonna get uh, that's, that's fine. I, I thought of it like at the very end, and I was like, I think it might be a bit too late, but it's all good. It, it happens. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, thank you, Jason, and everybody else who were able to make this possible this evening with uh, Winston. That was fantastic. So, thank you all. Chris, hey. I haven't seen you in forever. What's up? Hey, <laughs> Yo. Chris. Hey, Joey. <laughs> and Richard, I liked your shirt. Don't let him give you credit about the uh, red shirt. <laughs> <laughs>
Let's hear the Let's original. Just say the, li- the line is long and distinguished. Get, you know, people give me a bunch of guff about anything. So I'll just make room. somebody has to wear it. Recon by sacrifice. 